So today I'm at All Saints Church in Malden in Essex and I'd like to talk a bit about Malden before we go on to the church. So Malden is situated by the Blackwater Estuary in Essex and the town itself it sits on a hill it's 38 meters above 38 meters above sea level it's 10 miles from Chelmsford now the Romans established a port here soon after AD 43 when Emperor Claudius marched onto Chelmsford and Colchester so Malden has a long history of salt harvesting possibly dating back to the Bronze and Iron Age now the Romans industrialised the extraction of salt along the Blackwater estuary and they exported the salt which was highly prized to Europe and Italy now by the 5th century the East Saxons had settled here again and the port was established or more or less carried on from the Romans I guess now today Malden is a prosperous town with a population of 15,000 and the port is still in use Now the town of Malden was first mentioned in 913 AD as Maelden and its meaning in Saxon is monument or cross on a hill. Now the Viking raids took place here in 924 and Malden was a desirable target as it, as it possessed a royal mint in the reign of Ethelstan. Now as the black water flows into the North Sea the town was easy was an easy target for the Vikings and seven years before the Vikings from Colchester who were Danes attacked Malden the town was then fortified by King Edward the Elder who lived here now King Edward the Elder was the son of Alfred the Great now we move on to 991 AD I'll just show you just down there, that's where the estuary is. So it's set on a very big hill. So 1 to 991 AD, the 10th of August to be exact, there was a, a man called Breitnoff, he was a Saxon commander and a warrior, and he fought against the Viking leader Olaf. Trigvesson near Malden and a place called Osi Island and that became known as the Battle of Malden ultimately the Saxons would lose and they had to pay the Danes in silver the Danes because they were paid off they didn't they didn't sack Malden and they spared the people Now if we move forwards to 1066 and the town is still in Saxon hands and the lords were two free men but by 1086 the Doomsday Book tells us that Malden had seven owners these owners were William the Conqueror he was tenant in chief for three areas. Count of Stace of Boulogne and Sven of Essex and Ranulf Peveril. And between them they had the rest. Now Malden at the time was a big settlement. And in 1086 it had 54 households with over 500 sheep, 180 pigs, 140 cattle eight plough teams and eight slaves now we're going to go on to just looking at this lovely 
hotel here. This one uh, dates to the 14th century on the rear wall, I believe, and it's uh, the front of it is more modern. So if we go into the church itself, which we're standing at now, so this is the All Saints. And the church itself is set on the north side of the High Street. It has in the tower 12th century fragments of stone. So we know there was a church here. It was highly likely that it was built by Robert de Mantel. Now Robert de Mantel, he was Lord of the Manor of Little Malden and he was Sheriff of Essex for 12 years. The Mantel um, founded Beely Abbey in 1180, which is three miles from here. So three miles, three miles from this church. <clears throat> the Abbey um, obtained a royal charter from King Richard I in 1189. The Malden went on to receive 14 more uh, royal charters and one of the conditions would be that Malden would supply a ship for the king in defence and the war horse when required. Now the Abbey became a pilgrimage site for King Edward I and Queen Eleanor. So you can see there's a great amount of history here. Now if we go on to the West Tower, which is in front of us. Now the West Tower is built in um, flint stone, uh, flint rubble and limestone dressings. And what's unique about it is it's uh, got a triangular design, layout, and it's possibly the only one of its kind and it's most likely that it follows the contours of the road which gives you an idea of the age of the road that runs the side of it. On the top sits a hexagonal spire if we go on to the statue which we have here. This is Melitus and uh, he was the first Bishop of London of the East Saxons in 604 and he was responsible for introducing Christianity to Essex. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury and he was driven out by the heathens in 616 AD. He was also responsible for christening or baptising King Sabert in 604. If we go on to the next statue, this is St Sed and St Sed was a monk from Linda's farm and he established Christianity in Essex and by 653 he'd become the Bishop of London and he built the first Christian chapel in Essex at Bradwell on Sea on the Roman fort of Vafona and then he went on to build a monastery at Tilbury. The next carving and statue that they have is Britnov, he's the Saxon commander and warrior and his name means bright and courage, that's a Brit and a Nof. He died in battle at 991 at the Battle of Malden. He was buried at Ely Abbey, then exhumed, and he was buried three more times. And it was said that Britnoff was six foot nine tall, being finally buried in Ely Cathedral in 1781. Now they found a body without a head, and they believe it, that's why they know he's six foot nine. 
This is Robert de Montel, and he was Lord of the Manor of Malden and Sheriff of Essex for 12 years. He founded Beale Abbey and it's highly possible he built this church. He, this was in the reign of Edward II and Richard I. This is Sir Robert Darcy and he was born in Danbury near Malden. He became an MP for Malden in the time of King Henry VI. He married Elizabeth Tyrell of Heron Hall in Essex and Robert began as a lawyer. In November 1401, Darcy represented Malden against the Bishop of London and Dar Darcy won the case and Moot Hall was given to the citizens of Malden. He became a Crown lawyer and by 1430 he obtained royal licences to ship grain from Malden to the Netherlands. He died in 1448 and is buried at All Saints. He had two sons and six daughters and several wives in his life. I'm just going to walk through his headstones. It's really nice now as the sun's come out. It's very windy. But I hope you can hear me okay. So this is Dr. Thomas Plume and he was baptised here in All Saints in 1630. He became a rector or a vicar in Greenwich in London in 1658. And this role would last him for 46 years. Plume had an appetite for books and his collection grew to over 8,000. And they were left to the community here for any gentleman or scholar to read in Malden. Plume was also uh, deeply concerned with the education of the poor and he established Malden's workhouse for the poor. Thomas Plume died childless in 1704, leaving his entire wealth to charity. So we shall now go into the fantastic church itself. Just one other thing, if you look at these windows, these actually lead down or look into or out of the crypt. So if we start with the door here, this door is 14th century and it's oak vertical moulded and now studded ribs and you can see just the fantastic detail. Old team century. Still got the original bolt. Fantastic. Now we're actually in the south aisle. The south aisle is 50 feet by 18 feet and it's, full, it's entirely built in the 14th century. If you look on the, on the south wall there, you've got heavily, let's go over here a bit, got heavily moulded arches and bays and heads. This was known as a sedilia and it basically stands for a row of carved seat and if you look here you can see these seats were designed for priests and the assistance of the priest to sit down if we look here this is the stairwell stairway to the crypt the crypt's fairly large, it's 21 by 14 feet. And inside it's got 14, uh, sorry, inside it's got vertical, it's got a vaulted roof with four bays built into it. It was built around 1330. The crypt's also known as a bone hole. 
And you can look at some of these heads of which depict kings and queens of the time. 14th century. And the detail on the stonework is incredible, right? Magnificent. And it continues all the way across. Goes on and on. Now we're entering the nave. Now the nave was actually built in 1728, except for the South Arcade, which I believe is that corner there. So that's 14th century. The rest of this is basically 1728. Now we come onto the bell tower and you can see the triangular shape of it. It's most unusual. It's got a 13th century window and this is um, and it's got 18th century glass. And you can see the bells of bell ropes. And if you look back you can see an ancient doorway this has got 12th century masonry around that area now the bells there are six bells plus a sanctus bell four are by henry pleasant 1707 now henry pleasant's foundry was in sudbury and the bells would leave by barge and they would pass under an old wooden bridge and I believe that they would be coming down here to Malden. Now Henry cast 72 bells throughout Anglia and Henry Pleasant died one year after making the bells for all saints here. Now the Sanctus bell is made was made by John Swain and Richard Lynn. It's either 15th or 16th century. No records can be found. And you can see these churches, they rely on donations. It helps them. It's always good to purchase something if you can. No matter how small, then up there you have various Royal paintings in wood, on wood. We're going to pass over a couple of old tombs or stones. These could be connected to Robert Darcy's family. The brass work's long been since removed. You see two ladies there that would have had Latin inscriptions coming out and their family crest. This organ has been heavily restored, I believe it's 19th century. Fairly modern pulpit in oak. Now we're entering the, the chancel. Now the chancel is 32 feet by 21 feet. It's late 15th century, renovated around the 18th century. Again, another extension of another smaller organ there. So we're entering up to the high altar area and see all the Wonderful oak chairs. Now right in front of us we have 
Reredos, which was installed in 1869. And the paintings are by Robert Nightingale, who was a well-known local artist. He was orphaned at the age of eight and apprenticed by local painter J. Stannard. And he, Robert was well known for paint for, for make, well known for paintings of cattle and dogs. These are uh, paintings that we see in front. These reredos were renovated in 2019. So that's going to go up here. Bit. Fantastic. various memorials there. Detail everywhere you look. Now this we're going to enter is the South Chapel but it's also known as the Darcy Chapel. It was built in 1443 as a chantry for Sir Robert Darcy in the time of King Henry VI. Ah, it's locked. Go around this way. So 1443. Now if we look at this memorial here, this is directly connected to Robert Darcy. You can see on the top there, the family crest. And what it says is uh, Sir Robert Darcy ordained in his will that on his death a chantry called Darcy's Chantry should be established here and two chaplains to celebrate Mass daily before the altar of the Holy Trinity for his soul and the souls of his wives, uh, Margaret and Alice, his, wife, his family and for the King and Queen. It, this uh, chant chapel was suppressed in 1544 at the Reformation, it was subsequently used by occupants of family pews. It was re-established in the 1920s. So I guess that's what you call purgatory in the medieval uh, belief that they, uh, they believed that the more people that prayed for them, they would be um, helped along to heaven. Now we're looking at the Washington Memorial Window. Fantastic work of art. It was built in 1928 and it was unveiled by the Ambassador of the United States of America. The glass was a gift from the citizens of Malden in Massachusetts in memory of Reverend Lawrence Washington, who was the great great grandfather of George Washington, the first president of America. It was designed by Nichols, Nicholas Nicholson of London. You can see the detail. So what we have is to the left side, we have um, St. Um, let's get this right. St. Nicholas is a paint, patron site of sailors who would settle in foreign lands. And we have St. George. which was uh, patriotism, and then to the right we have Joan of Arc, which stands for freedom. And if you look, you can see 
Christopher Columbus. We have George Washington there. We have the Mayflower Pilgrims of 1620. Fantastic detail. And then here we have possible Pasina, which would be where they would um, wash the holy vessels for mass. The role of honour for the First World War soldiers never came back. And Lawrence Washington, um, he was rector in Purley, which is four miles from here, for 12 years. He died of poverty in 1652, but... Um, Three of his six children emigrated to America, and the rest is history. You can see the ornate work of the oak screen to the South Chapel here. Beautiful, looks like Victorian period stained glass windows. Now these columns, which you can see across here, are made of Purbeck, which is a marble. And it comes from Dorset in England and the quarry beds are only 1.2 metres thick. And virtually all, all cathedrals use Purbeck marble, including Canterbury and Westminster Abbey. It's highly prized at the time and expensive. Only master marblers had the skill to work with it. Today, Purbeck is only quarried for specialist projects. You can virtually see where over hundreds of years people have pulled themselves up with that maybe brushed against it with various bags and stuff. Obviously Malden's got a massive connection with the sea, so some of these stained glass windows, this one incorporates um, a London barge. This was uh, in memory of Frederick Taylor. There's a church warden here. This window I really like is in memory of Dorothy Margaret Gepp from 1948. And it shows in the middle, if I can zoom up on that. World War II, the Blitz. Looks like the Good Samaritan. Um, fishing, sailing, I guess. This is in memory of Susie Gep. Possibly at the top. Could have something to do. Lawrence Nightingale, not sure. Now, also connected to this church um, it's the story of Edward Bright. Now, Edward Bright died, we'll go outside actually, in Malden on the 10th of November 1730s, age 29.
lovely warm now. Now, he was found famous for being extremely heavy, and in his short life, he was a tallow chandler or chanda, and that was um, used for that was uh, somebody who would make candles. He was also a grocer, he was a well known character. He was famous for being a kind husband and a tender father. And when he died, he was seven, uh, 279 kilos or 44 stone in weight. He was buried here in All Saints. The only problem was how to get the, his body out of his home, um, which they had to cut a hole in the wall. And after they did that, they, um, to get him into the vault, they had to use rollers and bricks to slide the coffin down into the, the vault itself. His coffin was three foot six wide and six foot long, and I think it was about three foot thick. So he was buried here in 1730. And you can see remnants from the past and a fairly modern door but still done in great style what's really nice about Malden it's a fantastic place to visit um, for pubs I mean there's one across the road there um, the history of the town the architecture is brilliant and then you've got the coastal side. I mean, look at the window up there. The way they've squeezed that window, it's fantastic. So a lot of different sides to Malden. So we'll just walk around the east side. You can see how the moss grows here where the sun doesn't reach too well. Headstones right up against the east wall. Oh, I'm going to hop over this old iron fence. The building in front, um, that is the rectory. I believe part of that is very old, 14th century. I've got no idea what that is and you can see how the salty air here can perish stone that is um, possibly sandstone it's gone straight through skull and crossbones headstone it's probably from the small pots that he's got that on rather than being a piracy thing And now we're on to the north side of the church. Got lovely green grass here. And if you look how everything from all the different periods are built on top of each other, it's fantastic. And you can see the nave, how I think it was built in 1728. You can see that now in red brick. Right, and we've gone full circle, and I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much.